So what many of you don't know is if you travel around the country and you go to other universities that have real estate programs, you'll find a University of Florida signature on those. Whether it's the textbooks they use, whether it was Dr. Ling who did the architecture uh, to help them do it. I was at the University of Alabama. Dr. Ling designed and wrote the program for us. So you, you guys are really well known across the country. And thank you, Kelly Bergstrom and University of Florida for all that you do for our industry. I also want to compliment the, the prior speaker on ESG. Uh, a year ago, we lost our 53-year-old industrial REIT because we were told by an activist investor that we were not good ESG. Because as industrial, we were the, one of FedEx's primary landlords. We, we cut down trees, we paved over the landscape, and uh, we brought in diesel burning trucks. And they didn't look at the solar panels on the roofs, the efficiency in supply chain, the redundancy of refueling, any of those things. And so a 53-year-old REIT, because you were an industrial, we had a horrible ESG score. And these proxy advisors like ISS and Glass-Lewis are almost as bad and evil as the Federal Reserve as you got explained to yesterday. And that presentation was absolutely phenomenal. So anyway, I want to compliment her. And everything she said, what you might not know is, um, I grew up in Colorado. I came to the South. I've been down here 35 years. And I had to learn a way to quit swearing from my growing up in Colorado and be polite in the South. And I learned that the polite way to call BS on something is barbecue sauce. So I have my own barbecue sauce. So that's what I meant by ESG is barbecue sauce. It, you know, great idea hijacked by bad actors on Wall Street. And she did a phenomenal job. So I compliment you all for bringing her in there. Um, here's a quick background bio on, on myself. When you get to be 60, you get to fill up a full page. Uh, my primary uh, role right now is I'm the CCIM Institute's chief economist. Um, so we have a good time that trying to help advance uh, the industry. I was in the Federal Reserve 2005 to 10, the last rodeo blow up. And um, everything that Larry said and what the Fed is doing in ruining our economy and our country is very much true. If you watch the PCE numbers this morning and you saw the latest PPI and CPI, the Fed's back on 50 to 75 basis point rate hikes. Inflation is as bad as it has been in the last two years. So what that means for our industry that's very capital intensive is how do we manage going from four and five cap rates to seven and eight cap rates because of what's happened. Uh, this is my disclaimer to protect the university and Kelly, your great program here. Any ideas are mine. Um, I have three adopted special needs children. I have a net worth of $100. I brought my square. So if I say anything offensive, you can get a swipe and take my $100. But these are all my crazy thoughts and ideas. So I'm going to talk about two or three economic things before we get into the ports, adaptive reuse, and space nomics that I'm going to talk about. And I think these are very important, and they piggyback off yesterday afternoon. So when I came along in my career, probably Todd, you as well, and Kelly, we were told we only needed to know two things about real estate. It was LLL, location, location, location. And the other one was that cap rates were 10% plus or minus two. You add two in a recession, and you take two away. All of those are gone. It's not LLL. And for the students today, it's LTC, location, timing, and capital. And as Kelly and Todd will tell you, that if you don't have timing, you really blow it. You can lose everything. And you need capital. Timing is terrible right now with the Fed and where we are in post-COVID. And the capital, we have a complete capital lockup. So the theme that you're going to see emerge for our industry this year, I don't know what Spencer Levy might say, but CBRE is generally a little optimistic because they sold all these people this real estate and they have to convince them it was still an investment. But maturity defaults. If you have anything with debt maturing in the next two years, you're in serious, serious trouble. And if you own an office building that CBRE sold you, you're even in worse trouble. So uh, if anybody do office here, you're probably OK in Florida. It's exception, especially Miami is doing well. But if you're anywhere outside of Florida, the office situation is very bad. This graphic here is a graphic of the Fed rate increases. And the red line there in the, in the graphic, this is the steepest, fastest increase in interest rates in the history since cavemen, ever in the history of the Fed. They've never done this uh, at this steep a pace, even more so than the 70s and 80s, which was more of a, a saw line that they went with Paul Volcker. And you need to remember who Jay Powell's mentor was. It was Paul Volcker. He's invoking the Volcker rule before there was a Volcker rule. And, and he knows no other way to do it. Uh, so Larry was exactly right. Read the book. The other one on the right is an index that um, I produced for the CCI Institute. I was co-producer of it. It's called CREPI, the Commercial Real Estate Property Index. And we got so tired of bad government data and rearview looking uh, data on the economy that we said we want one that's based on all windshield indicators. These 10 indicators here are all forward looking. University of Michigan Consumer Confidence, Green Street Commercial Property Price Index. Every single one of them are forward looking. 
We put them into an algorithm and we tested it back over prior recessions and recovery, and we didn't miss one movement by 90 days. Very, very accurate, and it's free. You go to crepi.com forward slash, uh, or site to do business.com forward slash crepi. It's free. The whole thing will open up. In the workbook is every worksheet. You can see every data. You can see everything mapped. Unlike the Fed, we are transparent. So that's a, a good tip for you and the students. Um, so um, before we go on further, I want to talk about what could go right and what could go wrong the rest of the year. So the wrong is the, the Fed and all those things. What can go right? Who's heard of the U-Haul moving report? Florida, everything ought to be going up here. It ought to be an extra credit thing on the exam where you can get 50% more on your exam if you understand this. So U-Haul actually tracks where we all move every year. They look at the past year, and for the last several years, even before COVID, Florida was one or two every single year. And then we threw in the Carolinas, and sometimes Georgia realized maybe it was an SEC sport, so they should rent some U-Haul trucks and, and get involved, put some footballs in there or something, uh, or recruits, and move them down here. But this is very important because this tells you where you can outrun inflation. This tells you where there's real estate opportunity. Where people were moving, and if they're moving at a growth rate of more than seven, eight percent, the inflation rate, you can outrun inflation. And these are those common sense indicators that are not bad government data. They're great primary data. They're not a survey of U-Haul movers. It's every doggone one. So this is really, this is what could go right. You all have them moving here. There's only one problem you need to worry about. All the people that are moving here from other parts of the world, in parts of the United States, they might not think like you do in Florida. And I think there should be a residency requirement before they can vote in Florida to give them at least five years to be re-indoctrinated into capitalism in Florida. Would you do that, Kelly? Could we, we get a re-indoctrination to capitalism program? I think I accidentally disclosed my political ideology here. <laughs> I know you guys don't want to give up Ron DeSantis, but gosh, America needs him. Uh, we need somebody like that. So just think about it. He'll still be in charge of Florida. We'll let him be both governor and president. We'll be the first one. We'll let him continue to his governor role. All right. The other one, who's heard of Urban Land Institute and their annual merging trends report? Again, every, this would be our required homework. So I was involved in the first one that they did, gosh, when I was back at Equitable Days over 25 years ago. This report gets better and better every year because they're surveying and involving people like you that understand real estate. This is really, really important. It's really important for you guys in Florida. It's gonna get into my space economics. So they just looked at what are the top three property types for investment. And for the first time in the history, 25 year history of this report, office and retail weren't in the top three. All you office guys wanna leave now? <laughs> Sorry, except for Florida. And you know who made it into the top three for the first time ever? Hotels. Hotels usually lead into a recession and implode. They're not doing it. And the reason I have in the bottom uh, left corner there is something called boo leisure, right? We copied it. We said we need a good Louisiana term because who knows what real estate is in Louisiana. It's just all oil and gas, right? So boo leisure is where we're doing business and I can work remote. I can go to a leisure destination like here in Florida. I can stay an extra day or two, work remote, do a conference, do my stuff, and I stay longer. And Boo Leisure, if you're a market that's attractive for leisure, business, even just doing conferences or doing trades, we all want to come. And we want to stay at your hotels. We want to bring the family. They can go to the theme parks. I can do work. Boo Leisure is a thing in hotels. So any of you students that think hotel is something you should avoid, rethink it. It's important for Florida because you have a lot of Boo Leisure. And it's going to do very well. All right, so now we're going to get into the importance of the three things. I'm going to talk about ports, adaptive reuse, and space nomics. So we're going to start with ports. So most people think that, well, Florida's not very important in ports. You don't even rank in the top 10 ports. You don't do much in logistics. Any industrial people here? You all agree with that? No. You have more ports than any state in the country. You all know that? So going back a decade ago, when I was at Collier's, I initiated their research on ports and logistics. And so this is one of the, port, the pieces that I did talking about the Panama Canal expansion, and I called it Biggie Size It because I love to go through drive through at fast food restaurants, and I always say, Biggie Size those fries, right? And, and from Atlanta, Coca-Cola, right? Got to have a Biggie Size Coke and fries, and that's how I got diabetes. Um, but now I got rid of it because I don't do Biggie Size anymore. And so we would do awards for ports. And we'd give these fun awards, and we gave, like in Jacksonville, we gave them the best audible because Jacksonville's like Cinderella, you get poor stepchild. Anybody from Jacksonville? Like Jacksonville? 
right? They don't get the support and funding from the state. They're a different structure. So when you look at Georgia and you look at Savannah and you look at Texas, those are state port authorities. They get state funding from the legislature. Jacksonville has a much harder time, but they were figuring out how to still survive. And actually, over most of the last two years, Jacksonville has handled more containers than any other port in Florida. Did y'all know that? You know why? Because of the Jones Act. Something goes way back to World War I, where we wanted to have a domestic shipping industry, and the only way we can get goods to Puerto Rico during hurricanes is it's got to go to Jacksonville, be unloaded, and put on a U.S. Coast Guard ship and sent to Puerto Rico. So Jacksonville is doing a great job helping Puerto Rico and, and places that are ravaged on that side. So this goes back a decade ago, and I'd like to ask you those of you here in Florida that do really well in industrial, can you imagine where we would be today, post-COVID, if we hadn't expanded the Panama Canal? Where would we be in supply chain? Where would we be in logistics? Absolutely nowhere, so it's a, it is a biggie deal. All right, also show you, make fun of a, my, my former, one of my former employers, the University of Alabama. In, in Alabama, the way I got the red shoes was I misspelled Coach Saban's name in my first email to the dean. And I explained to her when she said, how could you do that? And I said, I went to Emory University in Atlanta. We thought the SEC was the Securities and Exchange Commission. What's this other SEC you're talking about? So I had to call my friend Todd and say, can you explain the SEC to me? And so uh, I had to wear red shoes for my six months probation and learn SEC statistics every Friday and report them. So that's how we got there. The other thing you need to know about Alabama is, and the way I got my own company is, during uh, COVID, I got laid off. All the non-tenured professors got laid off because they needed to save money for the football program. And when they laid me off, I said, well, you won't win another national championship again. So I made sure that Georgia won the last two uh, since I've been gone. But in Alabama, they're very visual learners. They, it's X's and O's, it's pictures. They can't read a book. They can't learn real estate. There's too many words on a page. So we had to pass a legislation called Read Build Alabama. They hadn't done anything in a quarter century. And the port was this great port that was all bulk commodities and no containers. And you had Mercedes and Walmart and Airbus and Toyota Mazda all wanting and coming to Alabama that said, who can tell us anything about the port? And where do we get the funding? So I produced this uh, paper and we produced our own logistics transformer to explain to Alabamians how logistics work. So the wings are air cargo, the containers are the breastplate, the ships and railroad, the trucks are on the bottom, and we got the doggone thing passed. And you can see every page had a picture you know, in a big bold thing with just a few words. And there were even several pages that had just X's and O's and we explained the conclusions. And so what I want you to realize from this paper, and this was five years ago, before we knew what logistics was or supply chain, what we said is if you wanna know where industrial and supply chain and logistics are going, where to invest, follow the logistics infrastructure. And the logistics infrastructure, the rail, the ports, all that type stuff, it's all reconstructing in a north-south direction, not an east-west from California. It's ending. And so this was five years ago. So they all told me I was crazy. CBRE told me I was crazy about three different times. And I said, yeah, crazy, right? Their latest report just acknowledged this is true. Finally said this is where, it's gonna, where the action is going to happen. So to prove it, I, in, I created a concept called the Golden Triangle, partly because I was going through McDonald's all the time with those golden arches, and I got the idea. But the Golden Triangle is an area from the Great Lakes down to Texas and throughout the whole Southeast and Mid-Atlantic. That area is important because that's where over 50% of our GDP is produced. It's where over 70% of our population lives. And it's that region where you can reach everybody except the Californians in one day. Who cares about reaching California, right? Anybody care? I don't. By the way, I'll digress because Todd's daughter is here. Do you know why they, continue, they will continue to frack for oil and drill for oil in Texas even if oil drops to $10 a barrel? They are true patriots in Texas. And by drilling and fracking, they're putting more pressure on the San Andreas Fault so California will fall in the ocean quicker. <laughs> so anybody knows or has family in Texas, just tell them they're true patriots. So this is the golden triangle. And I said, this is where all the infrastructure is gonna go. And what we've seen over the last decade is every site selection story whether it's Toyota, Mazda, VinFast out of Vietnam, we're even gonna get Tesla here, Todd. You look at all the activity and the tech stuff here. We've even brought the Space Coast back after NASA said, we're ending the space shuttle program, get rid of it. And we hired all your NASA engineers and took them to Charleston for Boeing, and everything's coming back. So what we did is we said, to prove our point, this map on the right is an Esri map. We put the Golden Triangle on there, and we said, let's map all the logistics facilities that have been built in the last five years. 
So you can see, and I did good orange and blue colors here, uh, uh, Tim and Todd and, and, and everybody and Kelly. So we started with FedEx, the blue. Where is FedEx putting all of its new logistics facilities? So you can kind of see them in there. And then the black, we did Amazon. And then it looks like the wallpaper on the east there, that's Walmart. All their stores, all their supply chain. So whether it's FedEx, Amazon, or Walmart, the entire supply chain is east of the Mississippi Valley and south. That's where the logistics infrastructure is. That's the importance of the Golden Triangle. And you guys are a critical anchoring point, but you're screwing up on one thing. You've got to adopt the railroads. You've got to figure out how to get a railroad crossing over Lake Okeechobee. And since it's a problem anyway, let's just drain the damn thing, quit with the red ties, and put a railroad over there, and all will work really well. But you've got to take railroads as important. So here's another one of the paper I did last year for a company in to try to help Alabama get an inland port built. Now, they didn't know what inland was, yet alone port, put the two words together. I was going to have to come up with a new transformer. So we put this map together, and the blue dots on the bottom are our ports along the Gulf and East Coast. The yellow are inland waterways. And so you just saw the Golden Triangle, all the GDP, all the logistics facilities, all the FedEx, Amazon, and Walmart. And what we have going here is when you want to look at where you do supply chain, where you can get through the Suez Canal, the Panama Canal, all the supply chain, we have more ports, harbors, and rail than anywhere in North America. We're the epicenter on all of this type of stuff. Now, anybody from the Atlanta Fed here? Nobody from the Miami district? So you want to know why the Fed missed logistics in inflation. They have 22 ports and harbors from New Orleans all the way around to Savannah, Georgia. 22. When I was at the Fed, I was approached by Chairman Bernanke after Hurricane Katrina to ask a simple question. Will ports matter in the Gulf to GDP? And so I did the signature work at the Fed on that. It all went away when I left. Those 22 ports and harbors, the Fed has district banks in Alabama and down here in Miami and everywhere else. They do zero reporting and monitoring on ports and supply chain out of your port. And you've got 13 of them, zero. And the number two uh, Fed district is San Francisco and they do minus zero. <laughs> they, they, they shred stuff that comes out on the ports. This is why the Fed and what Larry talked about, they're so concerned about printing money and working with Treasury in this quantitative easing thing that they're missing the blocking and tackling. So many of you remember from your early college days, if you had to take something that wasn't business, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you got to be down here. It's food, shelter, the basics before you can get up here and do ESG scoring and all this other garbage, right? And we're not here at the Fed at the basic blocking and, and, and tackling level. We are remaking our supply chain to be totally north-south and ending the flow from California to Chicago and the East Coast. And to prove this point, this is the, some of the latest data and articles on what's happening. So you remember a year ago, the ports of LA and Long Beach had over 100 ships backlogged and they couldn't unload them and they had manual gantry cranes and all these kind of problems because you have to move everything by truck inland to the Inland Empire. And so this past Christmas, you wanna know how many ships they had backed up? Four. Savannah in Georgia and the Southeast ports had never had more than 10 container ships backed up until this past summer. Savannah had over 40. And 30 of those 40 used to call on LA and Long Beach. We are already seeing the shippers and they're going through the Suez Canal that has no problems. And we have to do slower steaming anyway, so it really doesn't make that big a time difference. And when you look at the time difference in sailing through the Suez Canal versus Panama or directly into, into uh, California, what you find is you can get all the goods off the ship in the port in Savannah, in Charleston, in Jacksonville, in Everglades in about one-tenth the time as it takes California. And the director of the LA port was on CNBC yesterday morning, and they were talking about how terrible things are at the port and how they're losing to the evil east in the Gulf. And they asked him, and he finally answered after the third question on this, why do you think that is? And he says, because we're 50% more expensive and 100% slower. So you put that equation in place, and it doesn't matter how long it takes to go from the Suez Canal. This is why you're going to succeed. This is why you're so important. So this is actually happening today. The other piece of this on the ports is the rail. And this is where Florida needs to really make an impact and step up. Because although you do have rail, you're not there where you are with ports. And there's a guy named John Dom. Anybody know John? John is probably one of your best resources in Florida on ports and logistics. Good friend. So this map is the spaghetti lines of the Class 1 railroads. We used to have seven. We now have six because Kansas City Southern and Canadian Pacific merged. Canada has two, two railroads, Canadian National, Canadian Pacific. They can go to dinner. They can have a cocktail. 
we try to get everybody together. We get to rent out, you know, former FTX Stadium to put all of our all of our port people and railroad people. The colored lines represent different ones. So the red is Canadian Pacific and the brown goes down into Mexico. It's our first class one railroad that goes through all of North America. And it's a big deal. So moving components out of Mexico into our Southeast manufacturing, moving commodities like potash and uh, lithium for Todd's Tesla and everything else out of Canada, it all comes down this way. I want you to pay attention to the dark blue line there. And it, I think this Tim is almost University of Florida blue. It's pretty close, it's better than my shirt, right? So that is CSX, and the light blue is Norfolk Southern. Canadian National is going to have to make a hostile acquisition of CSX or Norfolk Southern to survive Canadian Pacific. They're losing so much business. And with Norfolk Southern's derailment, no one's going to buy Norfolk Southern right now. The unlimited liability, buying out of town, the environmental cleanup. So CSX is my bet. So if you look at CSX and Norfolk Southern stocks, they're way down even before the derailment because they didn't have much rail traffic. It's a bargain. I don't make stock tips very often, but I would say I would be looking at CSX. And I don't own it, so I can objectively say it. If Canadian National makes a bid and acquires CSX, it is going to change the dynamics of logistics and ports and rail in Florida. They will build a rail over Lake Okeechobee. They'll tunnel it, they'll drain it, they'll do something, and they'll get rid of the algae and all the, all the tidal problems there. You need to pay attention to that because that's a game changer for you in Florida. It puts you in probably a number one or two driver's seat with Texas in terms of, and probably Georgia in terms of logistics and supply chain. Rail is incredibly important. It's the most efficient. It's good ESG. You take trucks off the road, all of those type things. Um, so pay attention to that. All right, my final point on ports here is my favorite indicator. So I hate bad government data. I love private industry data. I love what universities do. I love what you guys do in producing reports in your latest one that all the speakers, you know, you didn't know it, but they all were gonna talk about things in your latest um, report. And so it's the logistics managers index and it pulls everything in together. And for the warehouse people, it's highly concentric on warehousing. And when that index is above 50, the logistics and supply chain is working. And when you translate this down to the state level, it's like at a 60 or 70 in Florida where, where the logistics management is. So this is my favorite index that you can track. You can see how it collapsed and how it's coming back right now um, on that side. So we all good about ports. Just get some damn railroads here. Get them working more. You got one. And to show you how important it is and what it'll do, who's, who's familiar with Winter Haven in Central Florida? Anybody heard of Sean Malott, the director there? He single-handedly converted strawberries into industry. He took a page from Disney and said, Florida, stay out of our way. Let us have our own control. So they built their own road network so you don't have to have commercial drivers that move the containers between the rail and the warehouses. He brought industry, whether it's Home Depot or Publix or New Core Steel. Do you guys realize that you produce more steel in Central Florida than anywhere in America today? The second is going to be in Little Rock, Arkansas, because they can move it up and down the river, down to the Board of Mobile. And so he single-handedly turned all of that into economic development and the rail and center point was heavily involved. That's where the, the focus is. You're accumulating everything from South Florida, from Tampa, from Jacksonville, and you can supply chain the entire state of Florida and up into Georgia. So that's an example. If you want to look at the success of what logistics and supply chain can be, I call Winter Haven the inland empire of Florida. It is every bit as big as important. So adaptive reuse, who's heard of that? Our prior speaker, Ellen, would love it. So it's good ESG. Quit calling it adaptive reuse. Call it ESG and get good money and better scoring. Call all your properties adaptive reuse. So this is a signature paper I wrote for the CCM Institute, one of my first ones on adaptive reuse over five years ago. Nobody knew what it was, so we had to define it and show them pictorial examples, a lot of pictures for Alabama. Because at the Alabama, we had to show lots of pictures of what they, in the lower left one, that was a closed branch bank in a little town in Alabama that became a library. So these can be small scale. And so this is, this is the paper there. Here's the four components. If you're doing ESG, I mean ESG, adaptive use ESG, here's the four ones. You've got to have an existing structure. Can't be ground up new development. Number two, it's got to have functional economic obsolescence. Every student here knows what those two terms are, right? Right, economic, it's outside the world. It's the Fed. The Fed is external obsolescence. <laughs> it's killing our industry. The third, this is the most important. It has to involve a change in abuse. Just renovating an office building or renovating a hotel is not adaptive reuse. You have to convert it in its use. So think of a big box retail, going from retail to warehouse to housing or something like that. And the fourth one that I've added in subsequent papers is called the neighborhood approach. 
So in my first paper, we tried to identify individual adaptive reuse changes. How do you turn blight, something horrible, into something nice? And they all were one-off deals. Well, we did a paper for the Miami Realtors, um, and I'll show you this example here in a minute. What we did for the Miami Realtors was the neighborhood approach. And what we said is if you look at your city, if you look at your MSA, and you look at the, all of the problems, where, where do you do a zoning overlay that says, let's do housing and after abuse over here, let's do industrial over here, and you put that comprehensive plan in effect, you fix all the adaptive reuse problems in one place. So Windward Arts is a very good example, um, but we did this paper for the Miami Realtors, and we basically concluded that South Florida is as about as quintessential in adaptive reuse as you can find anywhere in the country. Look at Doral. Doral didn't even have zoning. They screwed the place up, right? And then they said, let's put government in. That's the first time I've seen government coming in after the fact, actually worked on. And they put in an adaptive use zoning. And it's working real well. Look at Coral Gables and what they're doing. Look at what you guys have here in Central Florida, especially with the theme parks. So here's the five key takeaways. Local government is still the problem. Local government is like a corporate in-house attorney. Any corporate in-house attorneys here? What's your favorite word? No, because you can't get fired. You only get fired if you'd say yes. So local government doesn't understand it. We got to do more, more work on there. All adaptive use projects do not need to be large. We have, a, we have branch banks. What's the next biggest adaptive use need we're going to see in this country? And it's, it's partly Todd's fault. So all these EV cars that are running around that don't go to gas stations and convenience stores, right? What are we going to do with all these convenience? We have a half million convenience stores that something's going to change. Half of those will close in the next five years. We're already working with one of the major oil companies on a plan to figure out how to close tens of thousands of gas stations and convenience stores. So I think the solution is going to be a new Tesla. Todd's working on the design for this. And it's going to have in the trunk a pop-out feature. It's going to be a porta potty So you can discharge while you recharge. <laughs> then we will we'll, we'll change whole the, the interstate stop areas. The third one is adaptive reuse is good ESG. Do not approach a banker, a lender, or someone on Wall Street or BlackRock with the term adaptive reuse. They have no idea what you're talking about. Tell them it's an ESG project, and they'll fund it, just like Ellen said there. And the last one is data collection. Who knows who CoStar is? So go try to search adaptive reuse in CoStar. No luck. We don't have the data collection. I have the largest database in the country, a little four-person company, 40,000 projects. There's more active adaptive reuse projects than there are self-storage. And so no one collects the data, so guess what there's not, Kelly? There's no permanent capital. So it takes philanthropy of somebody to go in and fix a local problem, and then they just have to put it in their portfolio and die and hope their kids like it, all right? There's no permanent capital. The rating agencies won't do it. As Ellen said, if they at least put it in ESG, it can get a really good ESG score, maybe some funding. So we have a real data collection problem. That could be a really neat undertaking, the University of Florida. All right, adaptive reuse can go too far. Um, these are, two, these are two real examples. The left one with the trailers is actually a case I was involved with where the DOT was trying to condemn this property and say it was worth nothing. And the guy would collect these trailers for 500 to 1,000 bucks and put them in place. And on the ground level that you don't see in the picture is a whole like RV park center for bathrooms and washing rooms and laundry rooms and even kitchens, like before they were ghost kitchens. And he was getting on average $600 a month for one of these trailers. And so when the DOT offered him $100 to take the deal, and I came in and did the valuation and said, try multiplying that by 20, and we prevailed. Um, so it shows you on the valuation. But that maybe is not what the Jetsons envision for outer space and housing. They don't want us Earthlings doing that. And then on the right, this one's got to be something in Florida. It's over near the Florabama bar. Uh, so you know the Florida Alabama line, and so uh, when they couldn't rebuild after the hurricanes, uh, you've got shipping containers and uh, airstream trailers that have become bars. Please don't send this stuff into space unless you have it where it's oriented to go into orbit and crash into a Russian or Chinese satellite. Then you can put all this stuff up there and just just blame it on something else. All right, the last thing I want to talk about, and hopefully I'm doing okay on time, is the space economy, and you guys know a little bit about that here in Florida. So we're doing some signature work. We have a paper coming out this summer on the space economy. We've been working with the BEA, the government that's supposed to know everything. They didn't know how to strip the space economy out of GDP. So we've been helping them teach the information companies, the aerospace, the defense contractors, the ones that shoot down Chinese balloons going over. And sometimes they mistake it and shoot down some weather balloons as well. 
Um, we now today, uh, you can see the information there, we have over 354,000 jobs. And two thirds of those jobs are in four states. Florida, Texas, California. I'm blanking on the fourth one. Um, probably up in Seattle or whatever. But those are the four places. This is the real new economy. So you, and we're gonna have real estate related to this. So you may not know it, but many of these private satellites that are being sent up. You can now lease your own square or foot on a satellite tile and have your own cloud. Manage your own stuff with no Amazon. And so if you just saw the latest Amazon earnings, they tanked. Amazon Web Service tanked because people are cutting the Amazon Web Services cord. They're going to private space companies and having them launch a satellite where they just need an inch or a square and they can do all of their stuff. So who's going to write the leases on those? Right? What's that lease going to like? Who's going to have Jordan? Who's going to have the legal jurisdiction? So if we launch that satellite from Florida, is it Florida law that prevails? If they do it from Texas, is it Texas law? That means no laws, <laughs> right? Um, so these are really important things. And then think of all of the ground level on Earth real estate that we need to support the coding, the launching, the manufacturing. This is a big deal. My forecast is that within five years, the space economy will be between 10 and 15% of our GDP, which is half of the housing industry today. Are you ready for that? And you guys having maybe 25% or more of that, it's a big deal for your economy. So here shows some of the industries and you can see information and manufacturing are big. You can see it's a small part of GDP right now, uh, less than, you know, just a little over a half of 1%, but that'll be 10 to 15% within five years. Um, here's what Morgan Stanley, their graphic chart. So you can see the blue chart directory. So 2021, 2023, you can see it's way down here and look at the growth. Uh, of what they're projecting in this, particularly the green, which is uh, on the consumer. And think of all of our cell phones, everything that we do today. It's going to be wireless. It's going to be satellite. And Florida, is the, you're, the closer you get to the equator, the better all the launches, all this stuff works, all the coding, the back and forth. This is industries. Right now, we dominate the world in the space economy. If you look at this graphic on investments and the number of companies, China is a rounding error. We dominate. Are we going to lose it? Are we going to let the Fed take this over and screw it up like they did monetary policy? Right? This is your frontier. This is a big part of your future economy. It's clean. It's, it's our national security. So Todd knows that before the 2020 elections in 2019, I was afraid that there might be a change in, in the politics and the elections in the country. And I said, if that happens, we might have our own form of Brexit. And I invented a term for it. It's called Flexit. Florida and Texas just exit. Will you guys please join Texas and just create a new country for us? You'd be in the top 10 in GDP. You'd have the space economy. You have all the resources. Please adopt Flexit. So something, another thing you guys could study. Then if you look at the, the externality benefits and the, you know the, the Space Florida. And I don't know if any of you have read the, the paper and the position paper that they put out last year. On, uh, on launching Florida stuff, and they went through all the aspects of the Florida economy. And it's unbelievable. Uh, so I put the, the link down there to Space Florida. If you haven't read that paper, go read it. If you're an industrial, if you need an adaptive reuse for your office building to put things that are supporting the space economy, it could become a launch tower. And you know these rocket ships that you see launch with external fuel busters? They're going away. They're gonna be Tesla batteries that are gonna, just like a Tesla car that shoots it, zero to 9,000 miles an hour in three seconds, that's what's gonna be launching the satellites. So it won't be bothering the environment, it won't glow as much when it does the launch. Um, and then, you know, some of these things, space for leading in space commerce and future lunar economy. Look at the billions of dollars in the SpaceX investments. Uh, space Forward has launched uh, a landing facility where they began their journey, you know, to the International Space Station. Everything that is our national security, our future economy, our telecommunications, our manufacturing, right? We're going to be doing manufacturing on the moon, and it's going to be Florida that they're going to be launching things back and forth and things we manufacture in zero gravity back to here. You guys, in space of Florida is a big deal. Do not do to space Florida what you've done to the port of Jacksonville and make it a stepchild. You need to keep this funding, um, and Ron DeSantis gets that. Um, the other one to look at is here's the investments in the SpaceX uh, and the coast. Really, if you think back to the end of the space shuttle, any of y'all remember that? And all the NASA jobs that were lost? 
So I was in Charleston, South Carolina, helping them make the bid for Boeing. And Boeing said, you have no stinking engineers and aeronautical labor in South Carolina. And I said, we can fix that. So we came down here and we optioned all your aeronautical engineers at NASA and the Space Shuttle Program and said, if we win in Charleston, we'll buy your house out and we'll pay you 50% more to move to Charleston and help with Boeing. And we won the deal. Boeing said, if you can do that, deal done. That is the true story on how Boeing ended up in Charleston, South Carolina. It should have been here in Florida. You had the resource, but nobody was, was connecting the dots properly. So Todd was nice enough. He always sent me stuff, and he's always taunting me to put them in a slide. So I was showing different graphics. I was in Montana when the space balloon was first spotted over the Montana silos and uh, the shooting down that eventually went in South Carolina. So Todd said, no, no, you got it all wrong. So what was really going on by the Chinese? In China, they tell you where to live, and you have to stay there. Anybody been to China? They tell you where to live. In America, we can move anywhere we want. So when they got the new U-Haul migration report and saw all these people moving to Montana and Salt Lake and moving down to Florida and the Carolinas, they said, we got to go figure, we think they're massing troops. And they were just trying to figure, they weren't trying to get to our missile silos. But Todd said, no, they really, they saw the movie E.T. It finally got to him in China and they showed the movie E.T. and they were really trying to shoot down E.T. So um, this thing is very serious. It, we, don't, we didn't realize how many space balloons are up there. The U.S. Weather Service on any given day has 1,000 weather balloons at 10 to 20,000 feet in elevation. And we've already shot down about 10% of them, thinking that they're China. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do, a lot of things we can do with drones. They didn't need to shoot it down in the ocean off South Carolina. They could have had a drone go up there and just drop a net over it and capture it and have all the pieces there. They didn't, they didn't need to do that. So here's where I'll conclude. Hopefully I'm on time, Tim. So those of you, who was born in the 1950s or 60s? I'm 60. So great, you're going to get this. All the rest of you, I'm going to have to explain Star Trek and Lost in Space. <laughs> so Star Trek, you might be rediscovering. My 27-year-old my daughter said she found this thing on TV land, and she said it was this old series called Star Trek. And it's really cool, Dad. And I'm like, yeah, I know, just like you discovered Pink Floyd. Um, and so we will, I believe, within 10 years before I die, be able to partake particleize us and beam us and goods and materials. We won't need a railroad. We won't need a truck. We'll be able to particleize a good and send it right to your house and put it on your front step. So get ready to be beamed up. You guys are in the best, one of the best positions to be beamed up. Don't get lost in space. So if you didn't get Star Trek, I know you're not going to get lost in space. So this was an episode, um, and look at the old robot, and they got stranded on a planet and trying to get found back. Don't get lost in space. You guys have discovered it. You guys are not lost in space. Let these other places like California and Seattle that are losing it and these other places um, help you stay in, in the top area. So get beamed up and don't get lost in space. And hopefully, I got there. I don't know if we have time for any questions, but ports, adaptive reuse, right? So ports, it's your future. Adaptive reuse, it's good ESG. You can get it funded even by Larry Fink at BlackRock. And the space economy, spaceonomics, it's your next economy.